which is our first. If not talking, put yourselves on mute um, and video off. Welcome everybody. Just a couple uh, more seconds as people join us. Still people join us, so just wait a bit longer. Right, we'll get underway. Um, Hi everybody, welcome to today's webinar. I'm Philip Aldridge, Executive Director at Hazens. I'll be your host today. Uh, today's topic is best practice female management. It's a combo with New Zealand Occupational Hygiene Society, Hazen and New Zealand Occupational Health Nurses Association. So welcome along. Uh, we're talking about key elements from the female, uh, female white people, risk assessments, uh, some case studies, uh, effective monitoring and effective control. So today is mainly around the thermal and the heat side of things, um, but we are thinking of having a cold um, one as well, probably around uh, March, April, once the weather starts to turn cold again. Um, so yeah. so we've got three speakers today. Uh, we've got Mariska Kerber, who's an occupational hygienist, uh, president-elect of New Zealand Occupational Hygiene Society. Judy Curry, who's an occupational health nurse and president of New Zealand Occupational Health Nurse Association and Derek Miller, who's an occupational hygienist. I'll hand them over to introduce themselves shortly. Um, today's, we've got about an hour, and the format is a presentation for 35, 40 minutes, uh, followed by a Q&A. Um, at the bottom there, you'll see your, is a Q&A bun button, so probably most of you done it before, but it's a Q&A button, so put any questions you have along the way, and we'll endeavor to answer them all. Uh, a copy of the presentation and recording will be sent out tomorrow. So, Thank you for that. So over to you, Mariska. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, I am going to share my screen, and then I think we um, kick it off immediately. So as um, Philip mentioned, we'll mainly be covering heat stress today. Our um, presenters are myself, Mariska Gerber, um, Judy Curry, and then Derek Miller. So we'll also um, do the presentation in this order. So we are a mixture of occupational hygienist and occupational health nurse, and um, we'll be covering some key elements, um, which include the effects of um, the thermal environment on people, um, which is what I'll cover. And then we're gonna have some case studies presented by Judy and effective monitoring and effective controls um, covered by Derek. So let's talk about um, the core temperature. I think we're all very familiar with the fact that our human body um, tries to manage our core temperature um, in a range of about 36.8 to 37.2 degrees um, Celsius. Now, um, we do this by various aspects, our body, and that's um, via um, conduction, convection, um, radiation, evaporation or even our metabolic rate, our internal metabolic rate. So what happens um, is if you don't have really good balance, um, you can have go into a heat strain or into heat stress. And this, um, this heat production process or the heat management process is also called um, thermoregulation. So if you are um, heavily clothed and you don't have that option to um, really evaporate um, sweat off and cool your cool your core um, temperature or your core body down and reduce your core temperature, you can go into heat strain, which is then a, um, a consequence of heat stress. So heat stress can be caused by, like I said, high ambient temperatures, out, working outdoors, high moisture content. Um, working in a humid environment, reduced airflow if you're working in an area with, with not good ventilation, and then also radiation, radiation from the sun, for example. When we look at some examples of, um, of the thermal environment, we have extremely high temperatures. Um, those are normally um, found in mining industries, in the foundries, um, your steel plants, 
glass plants, smelters, and um, working in a furnace or close to a furnace, all of those really give you high radiant energy. Other um, high temperatures you'll normally find working outdoors um, in the agriculture environment, um, construction industry, um, roadworks, fishery, etc. Also, military activities um, are quite common where you, where you have all this heavy clothing um, that you need to wear and then also work outdoors. Moderately high temperatures um, you can find um, in the bakery um, industry, bakeries, your commercial kitchens, working with, with um, extremely high um, temperature sources like, like stoves or ovens, um, in your laundry um, laundry facilities, boiler rooms, and even firefighting activities can, I imagine, be um, classed in the extreme temperatures or moderately um, high temperatures. But if we think about some of the other, other areas as well, you may, you may sit there wondering what other um, temperatures are you, are you exposed to or your workers exposed to? And um, if we think about the, the recent COVID scenario, what about all these um, external um, pop-up um, pop stations that was, that was put out and um, all those people wearing, wearing the heavy PPE while taking, um, taking the COVID um, swabs for the, for the drive-by by, uh, workers or, or people. So all of that can, um, can also contribute to being exposed to high temperatures. So what effects um, do you have on the, um, on the people? What effects does high temperatures or working in a, in a high temperature environment have on people? So there's a few things. First of all, fatigue. Um, it's a common one, but it's something that we, we sometimes miss. Um, then other aspects is prickly heat or um, known as heat rash, um, heat cramps, heat syncope or, or also known as fainting, heat exhaustion, and then heat stroke being the severe one. So if you look at this, it's really from, um, from less severe to extremely severe conditions. So just a small thing to note, and once you have been, um, have been exposed to, um, to thermal environments and had a heat illness, you are more susceptible to have that in future. So keep that in mind also if you have workers that's previously um, suffered um, a heat illness. So let's quickly run through some examples of what I just mentioned. So fatigue due to dehydration. Now, myself being in the pharmaceutical industry, don't really get um, thermal um, exposures to our workers or, or self, but dehydration is one that, that we are um, prone to experience. And that can actually happen without realizing it. And it can happen to employees outside of work and then they come to work already dehydrated. So it's not necessarily the environment that they're currently working in that can cause that, but it's also personal environment. So just a quick definition, Dehydration occurs when the body does not have enough water to function normally. So it's a very simple definition and I'm sure we're all familiar with that. But um, even though sweating is a really good mechanism to, to cool down the body and to reduce that core temperature, it can re result in dehydration. Now, two other items, alcohol and caffeine, are also significant contributors towards dehydration. And, um, as they serve as a diuretic and that increases your urine output and therefore fluid loss. Um, and lastly, like I said, the employers can come to work already dehydrated. So um, make sure that you, that you evaluate that and also do some really good awareness, but Derek will cover, cover that during the control session. So how do we test for dehydration? So um, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it's a really simple and a common test. It's called the pinch test. So what it, what it means is you basically lightly pinch some skin on the back of your hand and pull it up by about one centimeter before letting it go. Now, I know everyone's now um, taking the hand and doing the pinch test while I'm talking about it. So please carry on listening while doing that. And um, what it means is if you're not dehydrated, the skin will spring back into its regular position almost immediately. But if it takes a few seconds to settle back down, you may be dehydrated. So a very simple tool um, that anyone can test anytime to see whether they have um, adequate water in their body. Some other symptoms of dehydration. Now also um, to note is 
Once you experience the symptoms of dehydration, you're already dehydrated. So don't wait for the symptoms to, um, to occur before you do something about it. The body is made up of about 70% water, right? So you need to contain that water um, as much as possible. Things that can um, give you an indication of dehydration is a dry mouth, a thirst, um, and again, saying that, remember, once you become thirsty, you're already dehydrated. So it's really important that you keep, um, keep rehydrating yourself during the day and during work activities. Fatigue, like we just said, um, and this can also have detrimental effects if your workers are, um, are experiencing fatigue at, at work and also maybe um, when they on a, on a different shift. So there's not many staff and being fatigued during work, um, we all know can have high, um, high accident and incident um, repercussions. Furthermore, dizziness is another, another symptom of dehydration having a headache, and then also having dark urine. Um, there's there's a, normally a color chart that you that you get for um, for a good color urine. And I've seen numerous times that people put these in the, in the ablution facilities of the workplace. But be careful um, of photocopy machines because that can be quite, um, quite uh, not annoying rather, but um, frightening if your photocopy machine is not really giving you that true reflection of the color that you need having multiple photocopies done over time can result in the, the color of the urine um, on the picture that you're presenting not really being a true representation. Other factors that can also contribute um, to dark urine is your diet or when you're taking a supplement, for example, Barocca tend to make your urine dark. So also just when you do that or when in a training with your staff, also remind them of, of these aspects. So that's dehydration. Onto uh, um, another effect is prickly heat or heat rash. So that can be as a result of working in a humid environment where the skin remains continuously wet and you don't really get that option to evaporate your, your sweat off your skin. And it can also happen if you're wearing too, um, too many layers in a hot environment. That can result in the blocking your glands um, itching your skin and reduce sweating. Another effect can be heat cramps. Um, that's a painful spasm in one or more skeletal muscles. And I'm sure we've all had heat cramps one way or another. And as a result of profuse sweating without replacement of salt losses. And it can also be prevented by just resting in a cool place and replacing your fluids. Heat syncope or heat fainting. Um, this attempt is um, to reduce the heat load by the major surface of blood supply to the skin. So when you get extremely, uh, when you get exposed to extremely high um, temperature conditions, your body tries to get rid of as much of the heat as possible to, uh, to maintain that core temperature. So what happens is all the blood rushes from your, from your brain and to your, to your skin. That's why you also turn red because your blood vessels are now dilating and um, trying to get rid of, rid of the, um, the heat. As a result, you have inadequate blood supply to the brain and that results in fainting. So that can also occur when you wear too much clothing in a hot environment. And then lastly, another effect um, or two effects rather is heat exhaustion and heat stroke. Now, I've seen these terminologies used wrongly um, over the years, and it's important to understand the difference between heat exhaustion and heat stroke because it's also important to understand when to get that medical treatment and what treatment to put in place. So many times people refer to heat stroke um, that they had over the weekend because they were exposed um, to the sun for long periods of time or they were um, on the beach for too long. But in actual fact, that may not be heat stroke. It may rather be closer to heat exhaustion. So let's go through the differences of heat exhaustion versus heat stroke. And this will also help you identify when your employees are in, in either of these situations. So heat exhaustion um, normally occurs due to the deficient water intake, so dehydration. 
it's when your body temperature um, increases to about 38 to 39 degrees um, centigrade, your body um, becomes pale, clammy, and you have a moist skin. Your pupils become constricted. Um, you have, you're weak or um, you have extreme fatigue and you cannot continue work. Sometimes you can faint, like we just um, discussed. Your, your body tries to get rid of all that, that heat and um, rushing all the, all the blood to your um, surface of your skin. And that results in a loss of blood supply to your brain. So how can you treat that? You can place the employee in a cool environment and make sure to rehydrate that employee. Now, versus heat stroke. Heat stroke is when your thermoregulator fails. So your internal thermoregulator that's maintaining your core temperature is no longer working. So your body temperature increases to about 39 to 41 degrees centigrade. Your um, skin becomes red, hot, dry skin. Your pupils are dilated. Um, you have extreme thirst. It can result in a collapse or a loss of consciousness, and it can be fatal. Important that you seek um, medical help as soon as possible while trying to cool the body down um, while you wait for medical help. So I hope um, the quick overview of the fix of the thermal environment um, on your people have made a difference and that you've taken some notes and hopefully when you do some awareness training, just recognize these symptoms before it's too late. I'll pass you over to Julie who will now um, cover the rest of the session. Thank you very much and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you, Mariska. Um, and can you pop on the next slide? Thanks, Mariska's holding the slides for us. Thank you. Um, and I just want to just start with a little bit about climate change and something's changing and something's getting warmer and Derek just told me that you know, the, they're expecting temperatures of up into the 50s in Australia this week. So things are changing and the last couple of summers haven't been the best um, down here. Maybe the one before was better, but we had a real doozy in uh, 2017. And in 17, it really started to warm up quite early. So September started to warm up and by October, it was really hot. So the second case study I'm going to talk about is about that. So it's about being prepared for these changes and it wasn't whilst I was working in central Otago and Dunedin area or Otago area um, this was happening all over the country in 2017 so we can't expect these again and uh, we need to actually think about what what was what's coming um, the workers in the case of this event became very tired and I think the thing that I noticed with people who work in hot temperatures, and this has been both in agriculture and in civil construction, is the tiredness and the fatigue that get to them. And there's always a bit of a haves and have nots. Um, those who have air conditioning at home so that they can sleep at night makes a huge difference versus the have nots who do not have the air conditioning and they start the day in a fatigued um, fatigued anyway so they really um, don't are not set up well at the beginning of the day because they haven't slept well so there's there is a real difference between what you, your sleep patterns as well as the other issues um, but yeah we can just expect a lot more of how do we manage this next slide please let's go the first case that I wanted to talk about was just the common one that we see all the time as occupational health nurses. You know, we all get the call that it's hot and stuffy and we need some need it fixed and we're going to sleep at, at all the time. And this is just this one was really a, a, a reminder to actually do really good analytical um, look at what's going on. Is it the temperature or is it not the temperature? So this is an old building that's been relocated. It's quite a large building. You can, you can get about 15 people in this area. Um, and there was only about seven at the time that they were, and I've been over a couple of times, they kept going on about, oh, so hot and stuffy in here. And it, it was warm, but it was stuffy more than it was hot. You know, I've been in hotter spaces. Um, and so we, we 
sort of stopped and had to talk about it. And I said, so why don't you open the windows occasionally? And the windows are both south and north. And on the south side, there is no eaves on the building. So if there was any hint of rain, and yeah, this is Dunedin, it does rain occasionally, um, that the rain would come in. So they were reluctant. The other reason was there was a, a, a pallet burner in the next building along and the smell would come in. So we were reluctant to open windows. I thought, oh, that's interesting. So I still was kind of wondering what was going on. So I said, we're lucky enough in this area that we have really good monitors that we can get and monitor what's happening. So we monitored what was happening. And interesting enough was, as you can see, it sort of toddles along there till seven o'clock in the morning. From seven o'clock in the morning, people arrive at work. By the time they got to work at nine o'clock, it was starting to build, the CO2 level was starting to build. The temperature wasn't too bad. And they were, it was, you know, within sort of what we would call thermal comfort levels. Um, so it was a bit of a discussion. Um, it was a discussion with the workers. And we talked about how they could open the windows. And they used the actual monitors, are really lovely little digital monitors, to actually monitor their CO2 level and um, see what they did would make a difference. So they took control of how can we reduce it. So they, when they came in the morning, they did open windows. They opened the ones they could. We found some other ways of opening things that, and also getting some more air in there to actually see what was going on. The other thing they did was actually just limit the number of people they had in that space because uh, they had intended putting a lot more people in it. And they decided, no, that was just going a bit too far, that they wouldn't put people in it um, anymore. And they would just keep it at that number because it worked. So the workers were part of the solution um, and um, they actually took control of it and they actually were really happy about it and they could go, oh yeah, we know what works and what doesn't work. So that was one, one, one of those ones where if you get that office thing, you know, and again, I've worked with Derek, I've had a chat to Derek about what do you think about these things? Derek's always a, a font of knowledge and go, have you thought about it? You know, and so that was that was great. But this was one of many buildings we were looking at at the time. So we've now got some science. We've now got the um, facility managers going, yes, we know if there's a problem, we go and investigate it. Instead of saying, oh, it's just them, they're just moaning again. Um, and it does make a huge difference to how people think and, and uh, um, act. The other thing around that is actually, as you come to refurbishment of buildings, one of the things that seems to have happened a lot is the need to put people out into the, the, to the edges of a building. So they're against the windows, which sometimes can be nice because you get a view, but it actually means that you get a lot of heat coming through the windows. So looking at refurbishment, looking at thermal layering on windows, decent blinds that keep the heat out and also the layout of where people sit. So getting the engineering in early that design and how the conditioning works. Um, the worst building I came across was a new build and that was small office, people saying we're too hot, we're too tired. Went and had a look and said, oh, something doesn't seem right, it is hot. Um, and what we found was that the air conditioning unit had been plumbed around the wrong way and it actually was pouring heat, heated air into, heated stale air into the office space instead of cooling. So it is always worth ask, 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 and see what's going on. The next case study, if you click the slide over, is looking at problems and politics of being out in the civil construction area. This has um, happened in the 2017 year when it was getting hot. And there was a real requirement to wear PPE and full PPE while outside working on the roads and the highways, and it didn't matter where. And this is that whole thing about risk assessment and how do we risk assess what people are doing. And so it was, this is required in one space, so therefore we need to use it in every space because then we can easily manage it. There was a pressure to get work done, which is always the way come 
September, October, November, the pressure's on. We had a whole lot of personal factors with people. We know that people aren't perfect, they various ages, various weights. Cost, what's the cost? The workers felt like the management didn't care about them because, you know, just do it, what's wrong with you? Um, but there were some really good things about this. There was an amazing health and safety team. I was just a contractor with this group um, who absolutely stood up for the workers. They understood it, they knew it, they'd been there. Uh, one was worked in Australia and so had had real understanding and knowledge of that high, work, high heat environment. The workers knew they were in trouble and they needed help. The health and safety team knew they were in trouble and needed help. And so they, you know, that's when you get that call, what can we do, how can we do this? And again, it was, it was that whole Hassens um, collective that we worked together. And so I knew that Derek would know if I, what I didn't know. And so we rang Derek and, and he came in and helped us out. Um, and I'll build that in a little, little bit more, but just having a look at the personal factors, thanks. Um, we had taken statistics from you know, previous years. So you can see that people did have pre-existing conditions. They had um, you know, high blood pressure and they were overweight and obese. Um, you know, sort of goes with the, the territory. There's about 200 workers in the field. These were only field workers. They weren't the office staff. Um, we didn't worry, you know, the office staff, we looked at them differently. Um, and some had the luxury of working within air conditioned machinery. Uh, they, they actually struggled from the actual high radiation heat really was the thing that got to them. And actually they were, a lot of them had headaches from the high light levels. So that was quite interesting as well. Um, it was a matter of gaining trust. And luckily I'd worked with this group for a long time. So they, they did, trust that we would do the best we could do for them. Next slide. If we look at, which is now written up there out on the WorkSafe website, there's a document called Man Managing Thermal Comfort. And just look at the factors that, that they talk about, the factors affecting thermal comfort. You know, the humidity was really low in this case. Um, the exposure to sun and other radiant heat sources were high. The amount of air movement was low or it was blowing hot, dry. Um, the demands for work, for the vast majority of them was high and they had to wear that full protective PPE, which wasn't comfortable and they had numerous personal factors. So it was all, all, all the factors all at once. So what did we do? We had to get our next slide. Um, we had to get a plan together and standing up for the workers and standing with them was actually an important part of that plan, um, that they knew that they were being listened to. Um, for me, that was, you know, I, I went out with to visit various sites and I actually was working doing some other work. So I'd get kitted up in the full PPE and go out and talk to them on site. And wearing that full PPE was, I'd have to say, I was struggling in the short time that I was there and I wasn't doing any work. So I, I definitely did feel for them. Um, but it was good for them to see me there. They knew that I could get a picture of where they were at. I wasn't doing it from an office and I wasn't doing it from a space of you know, comfort. Um, the uniforms were a, a big part of it. Um, and everybody started looking at various different uniforms, what was around, what, what could we get, what suited who. So we were still looking at that point at the full PPE. Um, but looking at various types of it, and some fitted some people better and, than others. There was an awful lot of people who were getting um, the prickly heat, and I've never seen prickly heat like that. I'm sure those who've worked in the military and other places have seen it, but my gosh, and there were some very interesting um, rashes that I hadn't seen before, and they were really uncomfortable with it. So some uniforms worked for some people, some didn't. So we, was, we tried everything we can. We collected a lot of data, which um, we will, Derek will talk about data collection. And we again, just engaged and looked at what the policies were. Next slide. 
Probably hurry them off. This is what we found in the, when we actually went through, this was part of the monitoring, we discussed it all with all the workers. You can see the range of things, the tired and grumpy. They were really tired and grumpy. They were excessively fatigued. We had them drive a home in air after they finished work. And the worry was that they would fall off the road um, because somebody would go to sleep and there were, you know, people were reporting that they'd had, you know, they'd got very close. So these were, the, the things that happened. What happened that really tipped the balance was somebody went into hospital and then somebody else ended up being um, medically uh, evacuated as well. And so that, that created what the heck is going on here and people did stand up and take a look at it. And suddenly we, were, we had the power to do. Uh, last slide of my group, next one, thanks. So what made the difference? The, main, the really big difference made, was made by people having individual clothing choice that uh, helped. We had good decision making. Um, Jerica is going to talk about the equipment we used, uh, but the decisions that were made as a result of the information, people could see what was happening. Education it was really vitally important about people's personal conditions and the conditions that they were working in. Could they do it? Couldn't they do it? Um, we got a policy change, which was an absolute miracle. Um, they, they decided that yes, the PPE requirement for that one highway area was important and they had to actually comply with their, um, with the transit requirement. Um, but they, I'm just not sure where that's gone because um, I've stopped working with these guys but they were a part of a pilot program for transit um, the last I worked with them. So that what they did was it, if they were not on that particular carriageway, then they could wear shorts or wear their sleeves rolled up and risk, they had to do a good risk assessment to see what was required and what they could do. And so that, again, it was about engaging people. Hydration, hydration, hydration. I can't, you know, that was the big thing. What we did was actually get a um, digital um, urine refractometer and I went around and I often did uh, urine samples for them at the beginning of the day to find out whether they were hydrated before they started because I think that was the big thing. It was no good at the end of the day they had it anyway and they weren't interested in doing urine samples at the end of the day. But we catch them in the morning and actually do the, the do it then and see what their hydration levels and they could then work on that. Toilets were a big thing. If I'm hydrated, where do I go to the toilet? And that actually was one of the a game changer was getting more toilets out and about around the various different sites. Teaching them to seek shade whenever they could, any opportunity to seek shade and get out of the heat was uh, important. And also the hours of work. We had some starting early, finishing early, starting late, finishing a bit later. But again, the politics meant that you were only allowed to work on certain carriageways within certain times. So it was absolutely fascinating. And uh, it was a really good working together and working with everyone to make a difference. So I'll we'll hand over to Derek. He can talk now. Thanks, Judy. Right, what we're going to cover now is looking at the me measurement parameters and the controls and where you can get more resources. First part is risk assessment, as Judy's been mentioning. Very important. This app here, called the Thermal Risk app, uh, available from Android and Apple, is very useful. It will allow you to, just using humidity and temperature, to actually carry out a basic risk assessment and you can go back into it, then you can make adjustments such as if I move a water source closer to them, do does my risk change? And your risk is given straightforward as a green, amber, red. It's designed for anybody to use and would be the first place I would do whenever you're going to carry out one. And particularly if you're not used to walking around with heat. Next, please. However, when we get into full measurement, which was that job Judy was talking about, there we had a number of different areas. 
So we've got more complex work going on. It's not just a basic one working off humidity and temperature. We're now recording a lot more data, as you can see, including radiant temperature from the sun coming through buildings, such as a breeze block, etc. as the sun walks through the building during the day, look at humidity, airspeed. Also, with a, what the insulation value of your clothing is, including your protective clothing. One of the important things is with protective clothing, it stops you sweating. If you're not sweating, you're not, the sweat's not going to, if you sweat inside it, your sweat's not evaporating off the body. If it's not evaporating off the body, you're not cooling down. Sweating is nature's way of human beings to cool off. So we look at those aspects and we normally do it as an area assessment. So if you're working on a farm, if you're working in forestry, outdoors, then we do a large area. We can do this also with people like working with molding machines and others. However, there are times you might want to look at personal ones. What is the individual factor? Because we do have the obesity, we have medications, other things, and that can affect individuals more than other individuals. So there we'd look at things like our metabolic rates, a workload, we'd look at the heart rate, and we look at dehydration. And just for your information, with the dehydration, for those who out there monitor it, don't use the dipsticks. Get yourself an electronic urine measuring device for the Pacific gravity. The reason for that is the dipsticks don't go into the clinical dehydration area. So we don't know how bad things actually get. It's also important to note when we look at these things, one of the reasons we look at all these aspects is that 30 to 70% of the work population are already dehydrated before they even start work. So once you push them in, the heart rates go up, other things start to occur. Once you get into the personal sampling, that you need specialists for. It is not for anybody to do, but the mm -hmm. more area one can be done by others. Next slide, please. Right, when we actually do go into the monitoring, and by the way, those pictures earlier were just examples. There are a lot of different things out on the market. And when you're going to buy, what index does it do? So we've got the basic risk assessment, use your app. When we do area, the most commonly used and misused is the wet bulb globe A temperature index, a WBGT for short. It's over 60 years old. There have been amendments and changes to the way it's used. It is useful, it is quite simple, and it is an estimate of the effect of the temperature, humidity, wind speed, including wind chill, visible and infrared radiation on the human being. But you've got to walk around what we call walk rest regimes, hydration rates, etc. A relatively new one that's come out in the last few years, and a lot of work's been done on it, and it's come from Australia, is the thermal work limit. This is defined as the limiting or maximum sustainable me metabolic rate that a well hydrated, acclimatized individual a can maintain in the Pacific environment a, to keep the core temperature less than 38 degrees and a threat rate of less than 1.2 kilograms per hour. So before you can actually get into the monitoring, you need to make a decision as to which type you will use. There's also personal heat stress. Two aspects to that, you can buy drops. So if you've got a lone worker or a remote worker, you can have a drop that they wear and it's linked to the phone and it'll monitor the heat stress in the area. A very similar to the Humidex system. It's also the physical heat strain at that point that's very personal. We collect personal information from height, weight, etc. that you need specialists to come in and deal with, uh, such as the, those of us speaking to you today. Next slide, please. <clears throat> right, this is just two examples of the index systems we're talking about. 
And as you can see, very, very simple system. Some of the machines even have flashing lights that correspond to the levels. And that can just tell you, right, in the WBGT on the left, as you're looking, if you're, the index is 29.9 .9 or below, you can work for 60 minutes, take a 15 minute break. But when you're up into the yellow or into the red, you are now severely limiting the workloads. So that's normally for people who are working to a timed schedule or a process. Thermal work limit in the working zones on your right, these normally for self-paced workers. So this is somebody that can say, no, I'm feeling a bit off. Mm -hmm. I'm going off for a break now. So again, these are out there. We can help guide you through which ones and you can actually adapt these slightly to your situations. Try and buy machines that are downloadable for monitoring. And this is a next slide, please. Thanks, Mariska. And as you can see here, data being collected. This is from one of the jobs that Judy was talking about. They were collecting it. They were emailing it straight to me from the download off-site. So even before they got back to the office, it was on my desk. We were able to look at this. And this is some of the work they did looking around risk. Here's just a nice way of presenting it. There are other ways, and you can see in the red, that is your high risk periods. And it's not every single day we will hit into the red. So we very rarely in New Zealand get time to fully acclimatise. You can present this type of data in whatever way you want that suits your business or your clients. Next slide, please. Right, <coughs> controls. When we look at controls, there are a number of factors that we are looking at. Mainly, it's to protect health. So if we can prevent the illness, or when it's mild, we can get it treated, it will stop it becoming a severe illness. So get in early. It's why we are monitoring, why we look after. It improves safety. So those, if people, are less likely to develop a heat-related illness, they are less likely to have an accident because of the heat. A heat stress creeps up on you without warning, as Mariska mentioned. And what we found is a lot of heat-induced accidents throughout the world is actually caused by a sudden collapse. People have left it too late. So if you've gotten nice and comfortable, then your safety actually improves. Also, productivity when workers are more comfortable, your productivity actually increases. Once they start becoming, your productivity will drop off the more uncomfortable workers are. Next slide, please. Thanks. Right, slightly unusual here in controls. As you know, normally we say elimination, etc., and we go down through the hierarchy PP at the bottom. Within the heat world, training and education is vital. We've got to have a knowledge of the heat stress hazards. The workers, as well as supervisors, need to know the risk factors, danger signs, etc. They need to know it so they recognise it amongst themselves and others so they can then take action, stop work, get off, get cooled off, recover, back in again. Engineering controls are one of the most effective ways Outdoors, you haven't got much cop. And ideally, when we're indoors in particular, or working in sheds, one of the best ones to go for. Hey, Derek, uh, two minutes left. Okay, thanks. Uh, so we can have reflector shields, we can have fans, cooling systems, things that increase the airflow. One word of warning here, though, if your temperatures are 36 degrees or above, do not use fans. Get help, because that actually exasperates the problems uh, you once you're above 30, 60 degrees centigrade. Uh, another way of doing it is to look at the job designs, etc. Do they have to do the manual handling can, or could you use machinery to do that job? Can you move it to a cold, cooler part of the day, as Julie mentioned earlier? Also, when you work procedures, look at them, particularly during the heat. 
involve the workers, have worker participation, work out what is the best way to do this. And it could be sometimes adjust the workload to different parts of the day, et cetera. Right, just a couple more slides to go. Simple risk outdoors. As we said, do your risk assessment. Communicate the conditions to the workers. Don't just sit there and go, well, I know the answer. Make sure it's communicated so the workers understand the risks. Make sure water, shade, cooling shelters are around. Can you rearrange your work? Ideally, if you're wearing protective clothing, etc., make sure it's loose, as long as it's not going to get caught up in machinery and stuff. Loose clothing will help. Uh, we've already mentioned train the workers and provide good guidance on hydration practices, getting enough sleep, etc. Funny enough, when we work outdoors, very, very similar ones going on. And from outdoors, again, it's a make sure you've got your shade, etc. And move the shade close to where they are. Don't make them walk 100, 200 metres to get it. And again, in that case study, Julia, uh, Judy mentioned, that's what we did. Uh, next slide, please. And as I said, here we've got a PPE. You can get neck bands, you can dip into cool water, put it on, and as that evaporates off, it cools the body. Uh, have a cool down area inside. If you're working with foundries, molding machines and stuff, maybe put in a little heat refuge that's got air conditioning in it, that'll cool off. You can use barriers between the source and the people. And again, most of them are exactly the same as the previous. And next slide, please. Russian slightly here, but you can read all this later on at your leisure. Two warnings. One, everybody is running around with infrared sensors now because of COVID. Do not use them on the skin and ears to predict heat stress. They can give lower readings, a 0.5 degrees or more. It depends on the technique, the make of the instruments, etc. All affects the results. They are not designed for that job. If you're going to monitor and you want to do the personal monitoring, get in specialists who can help devise programs for you and help you through the process. A last point on this slide is, as Judy said, highly influential clothing. A will make a microclimate inside. So sometimes when we do surveys, we monitor inside the clothes and outside the clothes to see what is going on. Last slide, please, Mariska. These sources, don't bother writing them down. You'll get them later. But just note, WorkSafe have two very good documents that was put together, not just by WorkSafe, but with specialists in this area. A, the Australians got a good one on managing heat. Thanks, Derek. I've shut you off, mate. And they just be aware that there are a lot of a, proper papers out there for all different workplaces, from agriculture, forestry, et cetera, et cetera. And if you are going to do this type of stuff in a full detailed survey, please use professionals, be it the Hazan's Fitchner. Whew. Thanks, Derek. Very good. Got appreciate that. Me. I appreciate you, Mr. and Judy. Um, one question uh, that's popped up. So fire, fire your questions by the Q&A function. I think you... Um, presenters. Um, one question for you, Derek, specifically. Um, you talked about 36 degrees and above not using fans. Is that related to the body temperature or the area being worked on? It's the, the air temperature in the area. So it's the atmospheric 36 degrees. Cool. And once you actually uh, put the fans onto the body, so below 36 degrees, fans have a cooling effect and you can increase that by putting a bowl of iced water in front and have the air balloon over. And it's got a natural cooling. When you hit 36 or above degrees ambient temperature and you put a fan on, you actually increase the risk of dehydration and you increase the risk of heat stress. It's got the reverse effect on the body. Cool. A uh, question from Marion. Thanks, Marion. Uh, good to have you here. Um, one around salt, probably one for Probably Judy might start for you, then go to you, Derek or Mariska. Can you discuss your issue of salt and taking more regarding cramps, sweating, etc.? Does oh, it have right. a positive oh, effect or not? I will I will hand over to Derek because he gave me all the guidance. Okay. On me. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, I'll let him talk about that. Okay, it, basically, 
in the old days, people used to take salt tablets and increase the salt. If you heat, if you heat, if you eat a healthy, balanced diet, you shouldn't need any more nutrients. I see my risk of nodding away there. Uh, you should not need to do it. An old, old trick, though, is put a little bit of salt on the back of your hand where you're going to pinch the dehydration, lick it, if you taste the salt, you've got enough. That's an old military trick. And we did try that. <laughs> did it work? It did. It did. There's yeah. something else to note. Um, I know nowadays um, there's low salt diets that yes. people tend to join. So in that case, when Derry talks about a healthy, balanced diet, it needs to contain your, your normal salt levels, not a low salt diet. Mm. And, and uh, the other thing that was probably a issue in there was the energy drinks and trying mm. to get people to actually use the energy drinks rather than drink the whole drink was actually cut them into water so that they were hydrating more because they, they get tired and they have an energy drink and just have one big hit of something. So trying to get them to spread it over the day. Um, Do you mean like Red Bull and those sort of things? Yeah. 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 Yeah, in one area we actually had to stop them drinking that type of stuff, the caffeine yeah. drinks, because that's caffeine and it was yeah. actually causing more issues around mm. the heat injuries than it doesn't cure, it's just an energy to drink. Yeah. If, if you're going to buy, you've got to buy the proper electrolyte ones. Yeah. Cool. Most uh, uh, caffeine. Oh, sorry. Question here from Barbara around uh, was there new swim information around the crash earthquake? Um, was there, is it basically, is there cooler type of PPE out there? Is there yes, a better range of, there is? There is, and I think that's the one thing that we learned. There was, a, when we, uh, and I just been talking to somebody, texting somebody who, just saying it was great teamwork and everybody had their sources and what we found that was some, some PPE that was really good, it had netting in it that allowed some airflow through it so that, that people could actually wear that. Some of it was air flowed around under the arms. Um, so it was actually, there is, you, you do have to hunt for it. Um, and you actually have to, you know, sometimes there's a greater cost, but it's a cost benefit. If you've got a worker who's happy and who's healthy and who can work effectively, then it's well worth it. Um, so I think that's, uh, you know, you do have to look around, you do have to find it. But yeah, we're a collective wisdom of people feel free to have a chat to any one of us and we can. Another comment there, um, Judy, was also around um, wearing high-vis and potentially replacing that with an already high-visible shirt. Mm. So a lot of companies um, in the construction industry, for one, moved away from the additional layer of a high-vis and issued their high-visibility shirts to all their workers. And you, you won't believe the big difference that a high vis make on top of your layer of clothing so reduce down your number number layers of clothing yeah, and especially where the tape is yeah <laughs> it's really high on the tape. you can also buy ice vests mm. like this yes. which you keep in the freezer and just use if you're going into a kiln or a hot area for a short period you yeah. can put that on before you do it oh. the, what about uh, electrolytes, drinking electrolytes or something like that? Are they work or are they useful or not really? I'm a big uh, front runner of just normal hydration with just water. Um, you see all these uh, sport athletes drinking the electrolytes and, and reducing the muscle cramps. But if you have a good, again, like Derek said, a good balanced diet and just rehydrate with, with normal water, um, you should still have a good um, thermoregulation and, and but emphasis on the good balanced diet with adequate salt in your diet. And that's what we found is that if actually often you everybody goes and I've worked in mining where they want, oh, we want all the electrolytes and we want this and we want that. And I'll go, well, actually, is it doing any good? But they, you know, there's sort of a massive uptake because, yes, we think that's going to make a difference. But actually, over time, they just that sort of drifts away, and they just go. I oh, actually, ordinary hydration works really well. Yeah. Sometimes, if you do get them um, some electrolytes or give them a Powerade, it's also just part of the the um, improved experience that the worker is receiving. So even though it's not adding any 
any additional benefits, it can just add to their morale for getting a, a drink at the end of the day instead of just plain water. So um, there's benefits to that. Somebody's put it depends how bad the water tastes, and I agree <laughs> with that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and I use the little dippy ones of my, my drinks now because some of the water around here tastes terrible. So yes, agree, agree. And especially, you know, it was getting cold water, um, getting people to um, put their water bottles, have ice, you know, put them in the freezer overnight so that they thawed during the day um, was a really good trick and most people sort of went to. Yeah, and another one is people often don't drink enough water. And as we yeah. said, a lot of the workers come to work dehydrated before they even start. Yeah, that's what so I found. To teach the hydration. Yeah. And a lot of the good water bottles will that are produced around this area actually have marks on it showing a your 200, your 250 mil, which you really hot environment, you'd be drinking about 250 mil every 15, 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually marked down some of these bottles so you can actually say, This is my hourly water. And Derek, I think that was the one thing that probably came through was how much water they did have to drink to actually keep their hydration up. Yeah. Um, it was it was a lot more than anyone expected. Oh. And also um, take into consideration their, their social activities. So they may be drinking the night before, not uh, rehydrating properly. Um, even though physically the alcohol has worked out of their system, but they still dehydrated. So they, they come to work um, um, already dehydrated on top of a heavy hot. Yeah, just one last thing on that. It's a make sure if you are providing water fountains, anything like that, or some place to fill up the water, make sure it is clean and tidy. Um, yeah. One of the things they became cheap drunks because they'd go and have one drink and because of the level of dehydration, one drink would make them feel quite a lot better than, <laughs> than but they were on that point of water, Derek. Um, it's also important to keep in mind with your drinking stations, you don't want to contaminate the water cups or any um, any cup that you have in a chemical environment, or um, if they're working in a good manufacturing practice um, industry like a food or pharmaceutical industry, water fountains are prohibited in, in those areas um, for that particular reason. Also, you can add the cone cups. I don't know if you've seen that, which helps them not putting it down at random places. Um, so they basically have to consume it at the water fountain and then um, discard of it immediately. Otherwise, it can be left on a, on a, a bench top and get contaminated and then be drunk after that. So, um, cool. yeah. Um, time for one or two more questions and a bit of wrap up maybe from, or parting thought from each of you. From Kirsten, do you take your take their weight to start a day at the end, see how much they've lost? No, they were, they were not engaged at the end of the day. There was no way you could actually have done that. Um, we found that, that just measuring their hydration level at the beginning of the day and talking to them at the beginning of the day was the only time that we could actually. On another job we did around heat stress, a different one from what Judy talked about, we did do the weight at the start and end of shift. And we also did their a separate gravity for the urine at the start and end of the shift. Yeah. So it can be done. Yeah. It can cool. be done. Yeah. Uh, Judy, press one for you. What is the safest way, for final question, what is the safest way to get someone's core temperature down? Oh, nice to get them in a nice cool place, get them undressed a little bit to modest levels and get some cold water on them. Um, the good thing that we had was actually we did have a few lakes and, and rivers around that people would go and put themselves in, but you're getting them oh, cool. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, yeah. thank you for that. We've run out of time. So um, perhaps it's a final takeaways or lessons, one or two takeaways lessons. Um, so yeah, Derek, any thoughts? It's do your risks. Actually sit down, look at the risk assessment. Go you go into get help. If you're in doubt, just ask for help. It's freely available for most of us. And start with your work safe documents. Oh, Judy? Teamwork, probably, um, is that we all have part to play. We're not all individual islands and we don't have, all have the answers. So we can all work together um, and engaging the workers. They are part of the solution. So get your workers engaged in the solution as well. Thank you. Ruska? 
awareness, I would say, um, it really starts with them, teach them on the effects of um, thermal environments on the body and they will speak up as soon as they um, notice something's out of the ordinary. So training awareness. Good thoughts. Thank you for that. I support that. So thank you, Derek, Judy and Riska and appreciate your time and your insight. It was actually very interesting. And I thank you participants. As I said earlier in the piece, we will get the recording out and a presentation out probably tomorrow. Uh, and thank you for that and have a, have a good day. Uh, Take care. Thank you. Thank you.